Yugish, um, we are supposed to record the talk so other people can watch it uh, when they have time. Is that okay? No problem. That's okay. okay. All right. Okay, let's start. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yugish Dindapani. Uh, Yugish uh, completed a bachelor, uh, sorry, Master of Science in Mathematics in the Indian Institute of Science in 2006 and a PhD in Applied Probability in 2011 from Economo Superior under supervision of Francine Baxilla and uh, Barrick. Um, uh, but this, this, this song, so I have a bit difficulty to pronounce his name, sorry. Uh, then he did a uh, postdoc uh, in the Is, uh, Israel Institute of Technology from 2011 to 2014 uh, under supervision of uh, Robert Adler. He joined ISI in Bangalore in 2014 as uh, assistant professor and then promoted to associate professor in 2011. Uh, Yugish uh, works in applied probability, stochastic geometry, and the random uh, topology. Uh, today, Yugish uh, will talk about Poisson process approximation, under stabilization, and the palm coupling. Uh, please mute yourself. Um, Yugish, uh, the uh, screen is yours. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I hope uh, everybody can uh, see the screen and hear me well. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Aiva, and thanks to the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk. It's a pleasure. Okay, it's uh, my uh, well first time virtually in Australia, and I hope uh, um, I would definitely like to visit uh, Melbourne, both the university and the cricket ground, which is not too far away. I checked. Okay, so hopefully sometime I'll visit both of them. And um, so this is a joint work with, uh, let me get my slides moving. Yes, it was a joint work with uh, Omar Bobrovsky in Queen Mary's and Matthias Schulter uh, in Hamburg. And um, it actually benefited a lot that Matthias visited, uh, visited Bangalore just before the pandemic. And you know, there's one reason in-person conferences and seminars help is that he and Omar were discussing something and Matthias was in Bangalore just before the pandemic. And uh, uh, we just could, you know, start uh, bouncing off ideas and it got started and uh, through the pandemic we managed to continue help us to keep uh, we'll away from all the hello is there any question or is it okay so in case there are any questions or so please feel free to unmute yourself i will try to check the chat occasionally but may not be uh, very frequently uh, but definitely at least I would ask somebody to maybe interrupt me and let me know if there's something in the chat. Okay, so let's get started. So I will break the talk into four parts, but uh, if, uh, in, you know, I would try not to cover all the four. Most likely the fourth, I mean, there are of course uh, more experts uh, in the audience than me who know this Stein's method better. And uh, so I would try to focus on the first three and if time permits, a bit of the fourth. And I also aim in a, such a way that uh, it should be possible for people to follow the different paths somewhat independently. Okay, so I will start with an application first and then go to the general theory. So it is possible to, you know, if you have missed some things in one of the paths, you can join in a second part or the third part and still I hope you will get something out of it. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so. I'll be, my setting will be a torus, a D-dimensional torus. I will skip one dimension for uh, convenience. Okay, so simply I will identify the torus with just the uh, um, unit uh, cube and, uh, you know, with the boundary edges identified, like the standard identification. This is the torus for me. And essentially it is to avoid the boundary effects. And then what do we do? Of course, we have it's a Poisson process I'm going to start with or a random points. So I will call eta n to be a Poisson process on the torus. And what do we mean by that? We take Poisson n many points, iid uniform. So I, for simplicity, I will take uniform, but one can take more general densities as well. Okay. So we take iid uniform random variables in the torus. 
okay essentially in the d dimensional cube i had a uniform random variables and then uh, you take a random number of them cos or many of them okay um, probably most of you are familiar with this and then what i'll be considering an important statistic of this data if you think of it as data is an important statistic is to each point xi you measure the distance to its k nearest neighbor for example the smallest ball which contains k plus 1 points including xi remember xi is also a point in eta n okay so the smallest ball containing k plus 1 many points around xi for example you take a figure where my red point is my xi for example if i take k equal to 3 this is the ball that contains four points and if i take k equal to 6 i look at the ball that contains seven points okay so this is like the distance the radius of the ball is what i consider as a distance to the k nearest neighbor okay so this k nearest n and d means nearest neighbor distance okay okay application so uh, i won't say much about this but definitely it's i will just at least throw some pointers nearest neighbor distances or so are important in computational geometry people construct graphs based on nearest neighbors and uh, in statistics you can see the book of penrose on random geometric graph where he says about applications to statistics these are also related to minimal spanning trees and something that will be of importance to us this is what is called a quasi local statistic okay we will see this later in the talk okay so i won't say much about the other applications but this quasi local statistics what we call will appear also a little later in the talk okay so this is a very simple uh, give me a data this is a, a simple statistic of the data that comes up in many applications okay now what are we going to do we will i'll just recollect poisson process nearest neighbor distance and here is the result that people prove what did they show steel and tierney and then also penrose uh, with uh, some variations is that if you take the nearest neighbor distance ri scale it to the power d theta d is nothing but the volume of the unit ball so in other word theta d ri d theta d is ri d is the volume of the ball containing k plus 1 many points the smallest ball and you scale it by n and then log n k log log n log k factorial okay you scale it appropriately i will just in a moment say why this what is the scaling you count the number of such points whose nearest neighbor distances after suitable scaling is greater than a what they showed is it converges in distribution to poisson e to the minus a okay so this is a random variable it converges to a random poisson random variable with parameter e to the minus a a good way to think about this is let a go to infinity if a goes to infinity this goes to zero it's a poisson zero so this goes to zero in distribution and in probability when a goes to infinity in other words what does it mean is that the largest among all the ris behaves of this order it says that this is the order of the largest nearest neighbor distance that is it is log n minus k log log n okay that is what it says divided by n okay so that is something we have okay so maybe i will just put a, a point here all right i think so all this is saying is that r max is like log n plus k log log n by n theta d r max to the d the largest of these to the power d behaves like this that is what this result is saying so this is the scaling of the maximum largest nearest neighbor distance okay so this is good to know and uh, uh cannot annotate and at the same time right and now what did people do is they looked at a further refinement of this 
Here is the following refinement, what was considered by uh, many people, is that you look at the point process constructed out of the scaling. You look at the point Xi and its scale nearest neighbor distance. Okay, or in other words, people sometimes call it nearest neighbor volume because you are taking theta d ri to the d. So you take the nearest neighbor distance, multiply n times theta d, then take a log n, k log log n, and also a log k factorial, and you take for every point. And this is a set of points in the torus times the real line. Ri's are all positive, but after scaling, they can become negative also. Okay, so you look at this point process, xi n of eta n. So it depends on eta n and also n. So you, for every eta n, you have ri's and you apply a suitable scaling. Okay, here is a result that Penrose proved in 1997. This is the following, that this converges to a Poisson process. Okay, so that is this converges in distribution in whichever, so I will be less this thing about the precise metric of convergence of point processes, but no matter what, even if you do not know, you can think there is some nice metric on the space of point processes or counting measures. Okay, or uh, you take xi n is a radon counting measure, zeta is a radon counting measure, and you take weak convergence of radon counting measures under weak topology, and uh, you can show that xi n of eta n converges to zeta, a Poisson process, on the entire torus cross real line with intensity e to the minus t dx dt. I'll point out one thing. The left-hand side is a finite point process. The right-hand side is an infinite point process, okay? So it's a finite point process converging to an infinite point process in the limit. And a nice point process, a Poisson point process, okay? This is a kind of idea that appears often in many, many kind of uh, situations of extremal statistics and so on. You take a... Um, a uh, sequence of some nice finite point process under suitable scaling and so on. The maximum or the uh, things which are very close to the maximum converts to a Poisson point process. Remember, this is the maximum. So by doing the scaling, things which are not close to the maximum get pushed to minus infinity. So you are considering things which are very close to the maximum, okay? Or of the same order as the maximum. That is what the scaling is doing is you are looking close to the largest nearest neighbor distance, okay? That is what we are trying to do with this scaling. Okay, let me erase this. The next slide, I don't want this. Okay. Fine. Now let's look at the same question, but I'm going to ask for the rate of convergence, okay? We all know that we have, once we have convergence, we want to know the rate of convergence, if possible. In some questions, it's much harder, but this is, seems to be a nice uh, uh, example where we can try to understand this. So for understanding rate of convergence, okay, I have to somehow truncate the point process. I should not look at the full point process when it goes to infinity but I have to restrict it to regions. So what do we do here is that I look only at the points Xi such that after scaling, now onwards my scaling is fixed. I don't want to focus on the scaling. Even if uh, one is unable to understand the scaling, let's simply keep it AN, okay? AN is a suitable scaling, okay? If you are not convinced, it's uh, okay. Um, but just believe me that this is the correct scaling. An is the correct scaling, okay? So I will look at all those distances such that after scaling, they are positive, non-negative. And I look only at those points, those points whose nearest neighbor distance after suitable scaling is non-negative. These are points in the torus. So this very recently, Moritz Otto independently offers and in parallel showed that in a suitable metric, I will de describe this metric later, but this is nothing but total variation distance between two random elements, the random elements being counting measures. This is the total variation distance between two random point processes. He showed that the total variation distance of this point process to a Poisson point process on TD with uniform intensity, okay? 
you can compare these two point processes in total variation distance and you showed that the rate is log n to the sum power. Okay, so very nice. It's a power of log n. It goes to zero importantly. So that is important for us. It goes to zero. And this is quite nice. So we got a rate improving Penrose result, getting a rate of convergence in this. Okay, now what do we do? As an application of our general result, here is the first or important application. Let's say we consider a more general point process than what Moritz does. We not alone consider the points, we also allow to consider the radius, scaled radii. We look at the points, scaled radii, and the scaled radii need not be non-negative, it can be greater than some real number. So we allow an extra generalization, which is Moritz took A to be zero, or that is Otto took A to be zero, we are taking A to be any real number. This is a point process in the torus times subset of the real line. Okay, points and the scaled distances. Okay, this is what it is. What do we show? That is Bobrovsky, uh, Matthias Schulte and myself. You will again look at a suitable point process, now not on TD, but TD times A infinity also. Okay, so you look at a point process on this full space. And then what we showed is what is called the Kantrovich Rubinstein distance. I'll define this again later, but for the moment it's not important is that we are saying that Moritz showed in some distance and we are taking another distance, which is actually stronger than Moritz one. Kantrovich Rubinstein is larger than total variation. And what we show is in this larger metric, these more general point processes have a rate. The rate is not even the same, it's actually better, okay? So you can see that the exponent here is uh, smaller than one. So we have a better rate, okay? And independent of dimension and all that. Um, okay, I will say the key point is actually that getting the general bound for Kantrovich Rubinstein and the rate improvement is we improve Moritz calculation at some point, okay? Uh, we realized that Moritz uh, calculation at some place could have been done a little more uh, better. And, uh, you know, even in Moritz thing, the same calculation would have given him uh, a better rate. But the more important is we derive the general bounds for Kantrovich Rubinstein compared to total variation. This is the this thing. Okay. Okay. So let me just again uh, show the result uh, for people to see again. And I will make now some remarks. So firstly, total variation distance is less than Kantrovich. So this gives the results of Moritz and also of Matthew Penrose, okay? Moritz result won't give Matthew's result because Matthew considers the general point process. Moritz considers only the projected one to the torus, okay? But we do. Matthew's is for homogeneous, XI's have to be uniform, but Moritz and our, um, our results hold also for inhomogeneous. Okay, non-uniform densities are okay, provided they are suitably bounded away from zero. Okay. And maybe need some continuity assumption or some uh, slight assumptions on the density for technical reasons. And our results also are true. Instead of Poisson, you take a fixed number of points, not Poisson, but fixed number of points. And Penrose in a recent work, got results for the total number of points. Penrose has results for the total number of points. The cardinality is to say total number of points, okay, in Bashastein distance, okay? So our results also will imply the results of uh, 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 Penrose for the total number, okay? This can be done, okay? So I will just pause a minute and if there are any questions, I will take it. Okay. So if there are no questions, I will make some additional, you know, why why is uh, this approximation useful? Okay. So the uh, point is Yugish, that, Yugish, yes? could I ask yeah. you to clarify the what sustained distance you use? 
K D K R. So how so this Wasserstein yeah. distance between uh, uh, two random variables that this, this is, is the total a, number. Yeah. The yeah. So this is nothing but let yeah. me maybe write it here. Your D K R. Your D K R. Yours. DKR your I will define later. I will just okay. define. All right. Okay. 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 Options. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. So I will define it. I just wanted to show just about the rate of convergence and under some metric. Okay. So DKR I will show shortly. Okay. So what other applications one may think of is that the following. Let me again. I'll just put the result. Is that what we have is that for some process approximation. But in fact, because you have a rate of approximation, you can also derive results near the Poissonian regime. That is when it is not actually a Poisson process, but close to a Poisson process. Still, you can use these rate of approximations to get something more than uh, what uh, you get in a Poisson process approximation. For example, we took this po point process, right? And the scaling was this. We looked at this point process with a suitable scaling and we showed it converges to a Poisson process. That is what we did. But very recently, in fact, this paper was posted after I was sent me an invitation. Okay, once I accepted in a few days after this, this is a paper of uh, Hurst, uh, Christian Hurst uh, Kang and Takashi Owada. Okay, and what they show is they take a slightly different scaling. Let's say CN goes to infinity and BN is this. I'll just come make it clear. And suppose Cn minus An goes to minus infinity. That is, Cn is going to infinity, but not as fast as An, slower than An. They say that Cn goes to minus infinity, uh, infinity, but slower than An. They showed a large deviation principle for a scaled version of this point process. Okay. Instead of An, you scale by Cn and do another scaling and they showed a large deviation with explicit rate function and rate BN, okay? They showed this result. So this is not important. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details, the talk I don't want to focus, but this is to illustrate that once you have approximation with a good rate, you can do things which are not just, you cannot derive from just knowing convergence, okay? It makes it easier to know rate and good rates. And they showed the other way around also. If CN goes faster than AN, what happens is this point process will actually become an empty measure. Okay, this will converge to a null point process. But nevertheless, by changing the topology, you can still get a large deviation. And they again do it with the rate BN and uh, uh, so on. So in this case, in the first case, BN actually goes to infinity. So the point process actually becomes, uh, blows up to an infinite point process and they suitably scale it and show a LDP. And in this case, it becomes a null point process. They change the topology and show an LDP. And they actually use our results. Okay, they use our results to compare it with a suitable Poisson point process and compute the bounds differently and do this. So this is what they do. Okay, okay great. Fine. So let me now end the first part. I will go to the second part. So this is the application to keep in mind, K nearest neighbor. I will now tell about our general results, which will which helped us to get these results about K nearest neighbor. Okay. Again, I'll pause for a minute, take any questions, if anything, uh, along the way. Also used to advertise this favorite quote of mine. It comes in Aldo's uh, book in the introduction that you know you want to. Uh, whenever you have a question of convergence, you would like to really know the rate. Okay, it's a nice way to put it. Well, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that often I prove only naive limit theorems. Uh, so whenever I have a limit theorem with a rate, it's one of the first times I have a good rate and uh, I'm very happy to advertise this code. Okay, because for once I'm, my limit theorems have an error bound. Okay. So let's move to the more abstract setting. I will illustrate it in the very simple framework. So we'll take a Poisson point process on a locally compact second countable house top space, a finite intensity measure. Okay, I'll take a Poisson process on some space with a finite intensity measure. And then I give two functions. Okay, what are the functions? The function 
takes a point of the Poisson point process and the point Poisson point process and gives the output of either zero or one. Okay. And then second function maps the point to a point. So here maybe I will just put it. I could have said. I should have said here x belongs to eta. Okay. So you have a point in the Poisson point process, the point and the point process together. For each point, you put a zero or one value, accept or reject. Okay. And also some value in another uh, space, nice space. Okay. That's all that matters here. Okay. And then I'm telling the following fact, it doesn't appear something messy, is that the function should determine only on some set around X. Okay, S is some closed set. For each X, I associate a closed close set. And then by knowing the value of the point process in a closed set around X, I should know the value of the function. I will give an example in the next slide. Same should apply for F and for G. Okay. So you may ask that I can take S of X to be the full space X itself. Okay, it is fine. You will see that this changes the bound. Okay, you can take S of X to be X in which case this is trivially true. Okay, but you will see what happens in the bound. Okay. Induced point process now. You look given eta. I look at all those accepted points, all the points that are accepted and consider the values. Okay, so this is a new point process for me. And this is a point process in Y. Okay, so I look at all those accepted points and map them to Y with some other function. Okay, so these are very generic functions. It can be anything. The only restriction is which doesn't seem much is it should depend on some closed set around X. The closed set can keep changing according to X. Okay, Around X, there is some closed set depending on which my function is determined. Okay, This is all I'm saying. Okay. And uh, there is a measure, intensity measure for the point process Xi. I assume it to be finite, which means that the number of points in this should be almost surely finite. Okay, This is not too hard. Right, it has to be finite because I'm taking with a finite intensity measure. Okay, so this has to be finite. Okay, so if you look at the intensity measure of this point process xi, because k is finite, l also will be finite. Okay, so k is the measure of eta, l is the measure of xi. This is my basic setup. Okay, okay. Uh, to just undo. Okay. I could have just okay. Now let's go to our example. Let's think of our example. I have a point process on the torus. Okay, Poisson point process. It has a unit intensity. Okay. So or n. You can call your maybe I'll put it here. A is equal to n times dx. A of dx is n dx, okay? N. Okay, just to clarify. Okay, and then ri is a distance to the k nearest neighbor. f of xi comma eta n is nothing but xi comma e, the suitable scaling also. Okay, it's the scaled uh, distance and the point. And G is my acceptance rejectance. I accept it when after suitable scaling, it is in an interval A to B. Okay. The scaled distances should lie in the interval. This is important. This is my constraint. This is my acceptance rejectance and this is the function. Okay. And now we have a local statistic, okay? So you can show that this is actually local because of this constraint forces things to be local that I have to look at only those distances 
विच आर ए एन प्लस ए एंड ए एन प्लस बी अवे ओके सो दिस कंस्ट्रेंट इज फोर्सिंग थिंग्स टू बिकम लोकल सो दिस इज द कंस्ट्रेंट एंड नाउ द पॉइंट प्रोसेस ऑफ इंटरेस्ट वी नो is that n theta d is the same thing except that after scaling they should lie between a and b okay so that is the point process of interest and this is not the point process i considered earlier earlier i let also b go to infinity we looked only greater than a so if i let b go to infinity i get what i want that is called a quasi local statistic that is it somehow can be expressed as a nice limit of local statistics this is a local statistic a quasi local is nothing but it should be limit of local statistics in some way okay in this case it's nice enough but i won't i will later only just briefly touch upon what is quasi local but it is good enough to understand local if you can understand local then for quasi local there is a nice it's a matter of good truncation okay so k nearest neighbor is nearly local okay with one extra truncation the k nearest neighbors are local we put this truncation b but if you let b go to infinity you get what we want okay so this is what we had earlier okay uh, there's probably a question maybe you are all correct so in the chat i can see i am unable to see the chat okay if there's any question uh, somebody can tell me uh, was there any question in the chat okay no no questions okay okay so let's go back to our general setting we have a point process for some point process i accept some points reject some points for the accepted points i take a function gives me a new point process in a new set not even in the same space x but in a new space so now comes exact definitions of the distances if you give me two finite measures the total variation distance is de defined as the supremum over the difference between the two measures over all possible sets well again all possible borel sets uh, i'm dealing with uh, uh nice spaces so i'll take all borel sets okay so your a is a nice class of borel sets okay finite measures i take mu a minus mu a over all borel sets here comes our distance kr distance kantrovich rubinstein this comes from optimal transport theory but i formulate a dual version not the original version okay the kantrovich rubinstein distance between two finite counting measures is defined as the supremum of the expectation of lipschitz functions applied to the two counting measures to the two point process your lipschitz is with respect to the total variation distance okay lipschitz meaning h applied on xi and uh, if you take any other finite measure lipschitz zr is with respect to the total variation distance here okay so this is what it is okay okay in a very simple terms it means that if you change one point h should change at most by one okay h should change at most by one when adding a point or subtracting a point of z okay of a counting measure okay now we have intensity measures l and i also have a poisson measure with m a finite measure l is the intensity measure of xi zeta is a poisson point process with intensity measure m okay now comes our result okay the result says in kantrovich rubinstein distance the bound between the point process xi and our poisson point process is upper bounded by the total variation distance between l and m l and m are deterministic measures okay l and m are deterministic measures so okay this is you can compute it's not too hard so you have to get approximation then 
it is variance minus expectation of a random variable. Xi is a random variable of y. Xi is a point process. Xi of y is the total number of points. Xi of y is a total number of points. It's a random variable. Okay. So it's variance minus expectation of a random variable plus I'm saying something an easy term. I'm not going to hide the easy term from you. Here it is. So the easy term you can see is where the closed set S comes into picture. Up to this, the S was not at all in the picture. It is there in the calculation, but not in the final bound. So your S is in the picture now. So the easy term is that for any X and pairs X and Z, you consider those pairs for which SX and SZ intersect each other and then compute two expectations, the product, okay? So if you take SX and SZ to be very, very large, for example, the full set, SX is X, S of Z is also X, then this indicator is always one, you get nothing, okay? So the point, of choosing S correctly, it's easy if S is chosen correctly, okay? I shouldn't say always easy, but it is not too hard to compute. If you choose S appropriately, the computation is not too hard, okay? This is what is this term, okay? And I will highlight a few points. Uh, it is reducing computing distances of a point process to computing something about random variables. We all know that for a Poisson random variable, the variance is equal to expectation. And what we are saying is that if the variance converges to the expectation for a certain random variable, the total number, you get convergence not alone the xi of y. You know, you may think that if I show variance of xi of y converges to expectation xi of y. Yes, it should be true that the xi of y converges to a Poisson random variable. The number of points, the total number. But we are saying something more. We are saying that the point process itself converges to a Poisson point process, not just a random variable. Not completely, we said there is some extra computation, but not too hard. Okay, it is not too hard to do this in actual examples. Okay, I won't show actual examples here, but you can see in our paper and uh, it is there, the paper is on archive and uh, yeah. okay, so you can find. So now maybe I'll keep it for one more minute and wait, take any questions if necessary. Uh, do you need hmm. absolute value around the variance and expectation difference there? No. You don't? Um, no, we don't. You can show that this will be your uh, so you can show you 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 can prove variance is yeah, bigger yeah, yeah. in this sense. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There is some positive relationship in there. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, because it's taken of something of a uh, you are taking a Poisson point process and then constructing something. Okay, this ensures that it will be. And more importantly is that, okay, you shouldn't say this alone, I'm not claiming maybe not positive, but this with the sum and all that. Mm. You also have a sum here. So it, it may not be, this won't be always not negative, but with this sum. Okay, with this sum and this sum. I mean, rather forget the first term. Okay, I'm saying forget the first term. Mm. This two times this plus the easy term is what is non-negative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's not that, you are right. They may not be a positive relationship, but this takes care of it. The easy term is, uh, I call it easy because it's written in an easy way, but uh, which, whatever it is, that will take care of it. Okay? Yeah. So uh, good question that this is, it, it, this is not necessarily, this can be negative, but it's taken care with the easy term. Okay. What more can we do? I, for simplicity, I, I took X to be a singleton, but you can take X to be a K tuple and apply the same thing. You will get exactly the same bound, okay? So instead of singleton, you can take it to be a K tuple and also get a bound, okay, same bound. 
something, as I said, quasi-local. This is important. You can replace the closed set S of X by a random set, S of X comma eta. That is, I said that my function F and G should depend only on a closed set S, fixed set, depending not on eta, but a deterministic set S of X. But in principle, you can allow it to be random and you will get an extra term, which is a truncation term. That's it. In, in practice, if uh, instead of S of X being deterministic, it becomes random, you will have a truncation term. Okay, this is an extra truncation term that will be there. This is important for the K nearest neighbor example. Okay. So this is not too hard. You can see that these are all not that fancy a bond. You just need to understand how it works. It's saying that if you can truncate to good random sets, if your random set is a nice deterministic set with high probability, you are good. Okay. So this is all very, very common. You are just saying that I, I should depend on some nice close set around X with a very high probability, that's it. We also deal with fixed number of points, but when you have fixed number of points, there is less randomness and bounds are more complicated. There are a few more terms, okay? When you have a binomial point process, not Poisson has a random number, but binomial is fixed number, the bounds are more complicated. Okay. I will say in the next part, what if you don't have a structure as, you know, I don't assume local statistic or anything like that. What if it is not local, not quasi-local? Do you still get some general bound? Okay. We have some general bound. Okay. I will say this in the next part. And there is an extension of our result, another recent extension by Otto, which uh, improves upon the easy part a little more. It makes it a little more smaller, which can be very useful at times. Okay. So, uh, some quick thing on related literature applications, uh, I mean, I should point out is if my F and G do not depend on eta at all, they depend only on X, where X are K tuples, my constraint and my function depend only on X, not on eta. This was an earlier result due to de uh, uh, Laurent de Crosso, Matthias Schulter, and Christoph Thaler. And uh, our results, we have also applied to extremal Morse critical points. In fact, that was our motivating question. And this was due to, I mean, this is used by Omar Bobrovsky in the study in, in random topology. And another point I said earlier is that it can be used to get a lot of asymptotics close enough to Poisson. Need not be always Poisson, but even around Poisson, you can use the bounds. This is what was done by Hurst, Kang, and Owada for nearest neighbor distances. And with Owada and the student, another student, Zifu, we are doing it for Morse critical points, okay? So close enough to the Poisson regime also, you can apply our bounds and still these are useful, okay? Okay. So if anything, I will just then spend the last 10 minutes or so on the A second bound. Okay, we will get a second bound. Okay. What's the second bound? Again, the same thing. I'll take xi zeta to be a Poisson point process on X, finite intensity measure K. Now, let me take xi to be a point process, some point process, I don't care, on X. It has a measure, let's say L. And I will take L to be K without loss of generality. L and K, if L is not equal to K, it doesn't really, the bounds get an extra deterministic factor comparing distance between L and K. Okay, that's it. And now I have the kantrowitz rubinstein distance between xi and zeta. Okay. This is nothing but some distance, okay, where you look at the all the Lipschitz functions with respect to the total variation distance between counting measures. So I have a supremum of expectation of H of uh, Xi minus expectation of H of Zeta. How do you bound this? Okay, how do you do this? Okay, here is a very classical idea. This is, uh, of course, uh, I picked this up from a paper of uh, uh, 
Barber and Brown, and this is where this idea, I, I mean, is used, and it's used elsewhere too. So I'll make a reference to this precise paper a little later. So I take xi to be a point process on X, a finite intensity measure K, a reduced palm version of xi X, okay? A reduced palm version of xi X, I call it xi X with apostrophe, is nothing but xi condition a point X to belong to xi, this is a measure zero event. This is a probability zero event, but nevertheless, you can condition and remove this point. Condition the X to belong to my point process and remove the point. The distribution of that new point process, that conditional distribution, condition point process is what I call the reduced palm version. Formally, formally, you can define it by saying for all F non-negative, Okay, expect it when you sum over all points f of x comma xi, it should satisfy this integral equation. So this reduced palm version is defined by this identity, which is often called the campbell mecker little formula. Okay, uh, various cases were proven by various of them. So in a more broader sense, it can be said as some people call it Campbell, some people say Mecker, and but it's campbell mecker little Okay, in, in full generality of dimension, space, point process, all that. Okay, so this is called the campbell mecker little formula, which defines this reduced palm version, this conditional distributions. Okay. And now, if zeta is a Poisson point process, mecker, or one can easily check that the reduced palm version is in distribution, a Poisson distribution, Poisson process. So that is the reduced palm version is the same as a Poisson point process. The distribution doesn't change at all. This is a property of a Poisson point process. But Mecker showed the other way around. If this identity is true for almost every X, then that is a Poisson process. So this characterizes the Poisson point process. If the reduced palm version is same as the original point process in distribution for almost every X, then this is a Poisson point process. Okay. So this is what Mecker uh, showed, Mecker's theorem. And um, immediately you get this idea, which people have exploited over the years in various ways, is the idea for approximation. If this is approximately true for almost every x, if xi x is approximately xi in distribution for almost every x, or a little better, I can say it's equal to nearly then is xi a Poisson point process, okay? So this is the idea, basic idea. When you use palm theory, <coughs> the palm distribution, reduced palm distribution is same as the original, close enough, then is the original distribution a palm Poisson point process, okay? So we will just state a formal result in this spirit. Okay, so. Very quickly, you have a point process, a finite intensity measure, reduced palm version is the conditional distribution. Kantrovich Rubinstein, I'm recollecting. What do we prove? This is the following. For k almost every x, suppose for almost every x, we have coupled point process such that two point process, I have to give, come up with a coupling such that one point process xi x is, has a distribution of xi, xi x tilde has a distribution of the reduced palm version at x. So for every x, I find a coupling of the original distribution and the reduced palm, okay? For every x, I have to find a coupling, okay? Now what do we say? That in Kantrovich rubinstein distance, the distance is at most two times the integral of expectation of the symmetric difference as multisets. Remember, these are point process. I don't assume simple. They can be multiple points. I take the symmetric difference as multisets. Okay? Between this coupling, these two point process, one is the original point process, other is the reduced palm. And look at the total number of points in the entire space X the symmetric difference, expectation and integral over all x, that's it, 
Okay, this is what we say is a bound. Okay, first thing. So in general, this this doesn't assume any structure on xi at all. Xi is any point process, and you do this. Okay, xi is any point process. Okay. Total variation distance, which again I'll recollect for between point process is given by this. Okay. Total variation distance between point process is given by um, just uh, supremum over all sets and then probability of this. Total variation distance is less than the Cantor Roberts Rubinstein distance. I said this, I'm repeating this again. And as I said, we were very much motivated by uh, proof and in techniques. It's very nice to, I mean, I was very happy to see both Andrew and Tim in the audience. Uh, their paper, they derived these bounds for total variation distance without the factor of two, if I'm right. Okay, and their proof was the uh, 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 starting point for our proof of this. At some point, we realized that it, we could do it with actually Kantrovich Rubinstein and in a slight uh, simplification. Okay, now, well, more or less the architecture is the same. And then Moritz Otto recently used the result of Barbour and Brown to derive these results in uh, total variation distance. And that is what he used to prove for K-nearest neighbor and everything. He used the result of Barbour and Brown, okay? And uh, we, well, we come up with more direct bounds also further, okay? He simplified this to the context of quasi-local statistics. So Moritz computed these bounds in the context of quasi-local statistics. Okay, so this is when we, okay, you say that we, you see that Kandrovich Rubinstein is larger. So of course, by a constant factor we differ, but clearly by a constant only. Okay. So that is quite nice. So it concludes this theory in a nice way. I'll make one final uh, kind of uh, remark. Um, what the point of Moritz and our results a little more is that suppose you have this special structure, you start with a Poisson point process, you have a special structure. You can do a more direct coupling, okay? All I want to say, I'll say this not too much, but very quickly, I'm out of time, I know. I should be concluding, I think I have two minutes more maybe, or maybe I'm- more Yeah, please, more. please um, yeah, yeah. I'll wrap up in one or two minutes, yeah. please. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll wrap up in two minutes, yeah. okay? so. You can do alternative coupling when you have a Poisson point process. Instead of trying to coupling the reduced palm of xi, xi, you can do a coupling which reduces to doing this following coupling, okay? You have to couple this and xi of eta plus delta x, okay? Uh, sorry, xi of eta n. So you come up with a coupling which is for this instead of the reduced palm version. So this is what one does when you have an underlying Poisson. This is what Moritz do, does. This is what uh, uh, we do. And um, I think um, I will not say more than these. These extend bounds for Penrose results and I don't want to go. As I said, the proof is, uh, I shouldn't, I, don't, I will not say anything about the proof. I will completely uh, skip the proof part and uh, sorry. Uh, by sharing itself stopped. Of course, you can ask uh, Andrew or Tim and they know, and there are others who know this better than me uh, in your university itself, okay? So I will just end up. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. And also you can email me later. Also, I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, criticisms. Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. First, thanks very much for a very enjoyable talk. Uh, you said that you can apply your results to uh, underlying processes which aren't exactly Poisson processes. Right. Processes. Uh, can you do that if they're close but not close, say, in total variation? When supposing your underlying process was close in some sort of Wasserstein metric, but, but not really close in total variation. Uh, okay. So this, when it works, is for example, I mean, when your underlying is not Poisson, one mm -hmm. has to use this palm coupling. Right. Um, so in some sense, 
we haven't really exploited this theorem. Uh, neither we do, nor does Moritz does. This is something we've been talking to Moritz somehow mm -hmm. to, let's say, look at these examples like we did, where eta is not a Poisson, yep. and you still construct something like this, and try to come up with a palm coupling of xi, when you know maybe eta is like a Ginebre point process, you know the mm -hmm. palm measure of eta very well. In cases where you know the palm measure very well, the palm measure is close enough to the original or has a difference by a few points. What I would expect is in, in, in a case of a Poisson, the palm measure and the original are the same. But suppose you know the palm measure and original differ only by finitely many points or a small number of points. Then I would still expect the bounds to work. Okay. But it should also mean wherever your results work, uh, this should still give the same under Kantrovich Lubinstein. So, but in the um, for our applications, I'm more thinking of cases where I know the underlying point process has a good uh, representation of the palm measure of the point process. I, I do not know if the total variation or Wasserstein is close. Does it mean that the palm measures also will be very very close? I don't know this. Is it true? No idea. Some oh, yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> okay, I will try to check this. I'll try to check if I have anything. I can say anything. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments? If you have any, just unmute yourself, please. Well, if there are no other questions, I can ask a question. Um, when you talk about the nearest neighbor. You can actually yeah. talk about any other geometric structures with some local local characteristics, something like the edge length of the nearest yeah. neighbor. Perfectly right? right. You can, right? Perfectly right. Yeah, you should can, be, you can. Yeah, the uh, argument should work. Yes. Why yeah. we focused on nearest neighbor is uh, yeah. uh, there are a lot of computations for nearest neighbor. So yeah. we didn't have to do, you know, uh, I mean, we just, uh, like we said, you just have to compute these variance expectation and this easy term. Right, see. So these computations were ready-made available for nearest neighbor that we could, you know, Moritz also did it. And um, right. we could just pull it off the literature. We didn't have to focus on the computational part. See. We could okay. focus on the ap application part and tightening the bounds. Okay. Okay. All right. So okay. it just reduced the length of the paper by a bit. Okay. Uh, uh, that we didn't have to do expectation variance computations afresh for all other things. But yeah. Moritz does for extremal hyperplanes, tessellations, all that. Yeah. So in principle, all of them can be, yeah. you know, more or less done here as well. If you plug in the bounds, you will get it straight away. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? All right. If no... More questions? Let's thank um, yeah, Yugish again. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.